And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest chit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A, you may have someone you may have seen in her in her in her recent playthroughs of Emberwind, as well as one part of the Wifers, Waifus and Warriors. What the hell is a Wifer? Um, D and D group. The our first our first druid in here, or as we prefer to call them, druids. The mystery of the druids. <laughs> the one and only Chibi Aurelia. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for coming on. I hope I didn't, I hope I didn't blow you away go, with how I open things up around here. <laughs> Not at all. Yes, it's the closest I can get to a to a buffer family entrance without getting sued by the buffer family. <laughs> that makes sense. So, a bit of a tradition around here, aside from the drinking is opening up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your earliest introduction to D&D and what made it stick, and just RPGs in general. Alright, um, well, I got introduced to Pathfinder after having played World of Warcraft as a kid with my father, mm -hmm. and, um... Pathfinder, I was like, whoa, this is really cool. I can say exactly what I want my character to do. There's no pre-built buttons that look a specific way or limit what I can do. Mm -hmm. And um, I went from playing Pathfinder to DMing Pathfinder in high school. And then from there, I got introduced into D&D. &D. And, you know, that in was similar because the Pathfinder version that I played was what is commonly known as Pathfinder 3.5. <laughs> and uh, so jumping over to D&D was not too difficult from there. And then now I'm playing D&D 5e and uh, more recently Emberwind. Mm -hmm. And I just really clung and enjoyed the kind of just creativity, improv, and... Um, imaginative sides of the TTRPG sphere. Mm -hmm. now, since you since you mentioned that background with WoW, um, why do I get the feeling you why do I get the feeling you stuck around with Druid for most of that? <laughs> um, <laughs> I played Druid for a little while, mainly healer Druid. Um, but yeah, most of most of my initial gameplay was playing around with um. Hunter and uh, believe it or not, Death Knight. <laughs> oh, I oh I can I can believe it, given how given especially especially Death Knights dur during um during the early run of of Wrath, where they mm -hmm. ended up pissing me off so much in PvP. And yes, I'm still salty. <laughs> just when you think you've get just when you think you've got them down, nope, I'm back to full health. Yeah. It uh, same thing with healers, uh, up until you run out of mana. <laughs> and then they did. Then, then there was that whole thing with giving certain priests co um, um, combo points. What the hell were they thinking with that? Yeah, uh, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I eventually dropped World of Warcraft altogether because it was just going down a path I did not enjoy as much, and kind of picked up the TTRPGs more. Yeah, I um. A little while back, I did I did an episode of the Geek Watch podcast around here, um, talking about the mass exodus I was seeing with WoW, and this this was oh, yeah. this was smack dab in the middle of all, of all those allegations and lawsuits that was turning um, Activision Blizzard into a shit into a shit show. Yeah, um, yeah, I recall those. <laughs> what I ended up learning is that a lot of the people who had left and jumped onto Final Fantasy XIV or Lost Ark or New World. Um, <clears throat> the they didn't dr they didn't drop because of because of all those allegations. That just happened to be the straw that broke the camel's back. It was a long time right. coming for a lot of people. Um, 
If I they, may, they lasted longer than I did, that's for sure. <laughs> um, if I may hazard a guess, given the given the time frame, would I be correct in assuming that you left around Cataclysm? Uh, actually, I left shortly after Cataclysm. Um, what was it? Mist of Pandaria. Mm -hmm. I left for a little bit there. I came back for Legion. And then I promptly left, like, not even a year later. <laughs> um, Legion wasn't It bad. seemed really cool. Yeah, there was just too many minute things that they were changing that I just, I was like, eh, I miss, I miss classic. I miss the way that it used to be. Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned classic because Legion will always be tainted to me because that was the same year that there was the infamous you don't want that moment at BlizzCon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, unfortunately, I just never got into World of Warcraft again, even when they released the classic version, um, or I guess re-released the classic version. <laughs> if, I'm being honest, you, if I'm being honest, you were better off because they released classic and then did nothing with it. Yeah. So... <sighs> and so whatever um, pro whatever progress they whatever progress they were hoping to get with um cat with classic just di just didn't happen and yeah yeah they're doing um cl um classic with w with um with bur with burning crusade yeah but the but the problem that rem the problem that remains is it's, is it just being a um, case of kick in the can down the road? Um, not sure if you knew this, but there was an attempt at an attempt at one point to mix um, TTRPG with World of Warcraft, a, a official one. Oh. Um, I did not know that. I'd be hesitant to recommend it n nowadays for two reasons. One, it was using it was smack dab in the middle of the 3.5 bubble. Yeah. And two, it's out of date, severely out of date. Like all, all that was really there was some was um, vanilla at the time. None of the, ex I don't think, I think Burning Crusade had only just come, had, was either hadn't come out yet or just come out. I don't remember the exact times, the timeline. But the big the big problem is that it had all is that it had all it kept all of the problems that three point five had at the time. Yeah. That and trying to trying to put in that whole spells per day thing into a get into a game that didn't use it. <laughs> yeah. I could see those being a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. I guess the closest uh, game has gotten is Neverwinter. Um, from what I hear, at least. I'd s Neverwinter, nev Neverwinter without mods. Mm, Neverwinter with mods. Yes. Okay. Um. Although that, although Neverwinter Nights two, notwithstanding, but the, but. That's a whole. That's a whole other can of worms. I'd say. Um. I'd say Celast. I'd say Celasta does a pretty good, pretty close job when it comes to adapting five E rules. Hmm. Okay. And so does. And to a de to a degree, so does Baldur's Gate three, even if it is a bit jank. <laughs> but. I haven't played that one either, actually. But if but um when you when you sh when you shifted over to um to TTR to TTRPGs did you did you lar did you largely lean s still lean into that healer slash su slash support kind of archetype? Um, so I actually played a little bit of healer and then also uh, definitely a lot of changeling and animal. I, th there's a reason I'm a druid. <laughs> um, I like the animals. I like the changeling stuff. Um, I liked being able to have animal companions or turn turning into animals, things like that. 
Uh, I will say, having revisited being a druid in D and D five e, um, I am learning that it is not exactly the playstyle that I would like. <laughs> Maybe if I had a different subclass, uh, but we had a lot of tanks, and I didn't want to go the one of the better subclasses for druid to be just another tank. Um, I've had my epic moments though, so that's definitely fun. But uh, I don't know. I enjoy supporting and helping others, but also um, there's something about like watching a fighter do their like uh, I don't remember what it's called exactly, but it's kind of like second wind, where they're able to fight like and again, basically almost like another round in oh. one round. And action surge is what action I usually, surge. Is what I usually do yes. Yes, uh, <laughs> action surge when when the fighter does that and they do like fifty damage in one round and I'm over here like two d eight. Yeah, uh, yeah, but it's been fun. I've been enjoying it. Um, I did play around with cleric for a little bit, um, but I found that I enjoy things like bard or um, warlock. Things like that. Warlock seems to be seems to be a pretty popular class. Um, mm -hmm. I would I um I do I do f I do feel that a lot. This may sound a bit elitist of me, but I think a lot of people um play a pet peeve I've had with with warlock players. I'm not sure if you've seen this, but they play war they play warlock just to be a different just to be a different kind just to be a sorcerer in all but name and not um not fact not factor in the way a warlock gets their magic okay um yeah cuz a sorcerer is was born with it <laughs> to not to not to right. not to bring up a meme a wizard <laughs> Cast magic because he's a fucking nerd. A warlock is is the is the deal with the devil, even if it even if it isn't necessarily the devil. The point the point is your your um your pact is supposed is is means you're supposed to be answerable to somebody or something. But in my ex I'm not sure if you've had the same experience, but a lot of people don't don't um factor that into their role playing. Yeah, I like to, um, <laughs> as a warlock, I like to try to cast spells and I explain that I don't know what I'm doing, so I just use what I think is a, a gut feeling, and if it works, then I'm, like, amazed by it, and if it doesn't, then I just kind of shrug and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, um, the last time the last time I played warlock was a, was a character named Tenebris. And the whole the whole thing is his family had a pact with the Raven Queen. And yep. Because of that, any any time any time he's dealing with undead or anything or anything like that, he is compelled to kill it, no matter what site it is. Yeah. Which causes some problems. But that's that's because well the Raven Queen absolutely despises anyone who tries to cheat the rules of death. Yeah, no, I mean I had um I had a guy in one of my groups that I ran where he wanted the Raven Queen as his person too, mm -hmm. and I was just like you immediately just want to destroy this undead thing before you mm -hmm. <laughs> with all of your being. <laughs> Um, but it was, I, I enjoy it more so for the role-playing how you got that power mm -hmm. from uh, the, you know, the upper being, whatever being it is that you choose. Mm -hmm. Um, and how you learn to use that power. Um, because it's not like you've been studying for it or were born with it. So it's like you have to get used to your power kind of thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's just fun to role play that part out. Yeah. Um, and I will. I will admit when it comes. To, I will admit one thing that I've tried to beat into my students is to 
is to think about that when it comes to martial characters as well, because it's all it's. You've prob you've probably seen this as well. Pl um, people playing people playing fighters and not thinking about why they why they picked sword and board or why they picked great weapon. Right. When. Th when there's a whole lot a whole lot of characterization that you can make just out of someone's fighting style. L um. There's been there. Hell, there's been plenty. There's been plenty of, there's been plenty of, in instances within within an, within anime within fi, within film, and so on where so, where someone's fighting school plays a factor into their character. Mm hmm Oh. And if I need to go with something a little a little more mainstream, well, there's the there's the forms of lightsaber combat, within Star Wars. Oh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Sorry, I love Star Wars. <laughs> no, I, I do as well, but that's that's one thing that a lot of people. It's something that a lot of people don't consider. Don't consider, and it it's it came to mind when you met when you mentioned that whole thing of um, the role playing aspect of how of how you figured out how to use one's abilities. Mm -hmm. It's a background thing that I th I think a lot of people a lot of people overlook because they look they look at the fighter as just a meat shield. Mm -hmm. Which, not the best way to do it. If you're doing beer and pretzels games, maybe. But um, no, you don't strike me as somebody who does be who does beer and pretzel. I mean, I might eat those, but that doesn't mean that's the type of play style I have. <laughs> uh, maybe I mean, not the beer, <laughs> just the pretzel. <laughs> okay, mead and pretzels. Is that more accurate? There you go. <laughs> that's more accurate. <laughs> but. For what it's worth, beer and pretzels is a is a shorthand for the for the quick and dirty kind of games. No pl no plan, yeah. just a bunch of people at a table and fi and figure things out as you go. Yeah, I only do those part of the time, like when I'm planning for my characters to go to the next city, and one of them wants to look for a fighting ring instead. <laughs> and I'm like, well, now I have to make a fighting ring. <laughs> Um, but most of the time I do a lot of planning and, um, I already know how my characters are going to be leveling up to the next level well before we even get there. Um, and things like that. Which I can, I can certainly get behind that. Now, if one thing, one thing I'm a bit, one thing I'm a bit curious about is, um, when it when it comes to when it comes to the stuff when it comes to messing around with um five e, or even even your time with with um Pathfinder, mm -hmm. did you did you stick to first party material or did you dip around with third party and homebrew stuff? So uh, with PFS, I stuck to first party material because we ran society. Mm -hmm. Um, but recently. I've been dabbling in the homebrew items, and in fact, um, one of the the things I'd like to do for like my streams and like the subscribers that I amass, I want them to help me build a homebrew world of Moongrove, which is where I'm from, my character is from, mm -hmm. um, and I've begun homebrewing based off of first material. So, for example, my Saturday group that I run, we're running Storm King's Thunder, but it is heavily modded to match and wrap around the characters so um there's like sections that i read where i was just like oh that's boring we're not doing that <laughs> and then i just decided we're gonna do something completely different that's more geared towards my characters like side arcs and things like that to make it a little bit more interesting and then eventually get them to the next part that they need to get to yeah um and I think I like that because the base story gives me a roadmap to go off of to then be able to adventure and explore homebrew on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely will begin adding external homebrews. Like one of my favorite homebrews is this short travel system where they turned it into more of like a role play thing. And they, it made it more meaningful. They got something out of it. And I thought it was really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, if I see things that 
sound interesting or that pop in nicely as a homebrew, even just as an add-on, I am definitely been more interested in, in joining those into my games. And that's my hope with my homebrew is to be like an add-on where essentially the lore behind Moon Grove is that a portal opens when your adventurers need it the most and it has rest and respite for them. Mm -hmm. And it's a safe place for them to level up if they need to kind of thing. Yeah. So. I forget the name of the I forget the name of the spell because I have so many spells in my head, but I remember <laughs> something not far off when it came to um when I can't when it, I think it was I think it was magic rope or something like or something like that. Um, mm. you know, you use a ro use a rope to create a magical respite for a bit for a bit of time. Basically, mm -hmm. basically a way to ch to cheat up to sneak in a bit of the um re of the rest mechanics without have without having to actually do a rest. Yeah. Yeah, something kind of like that. Um, but I also wanted Moon Grove to have the like a little place to sell items and maybe buy items like health potions or something as well. Mm -hmm. Little pocket dimension, if you will. <laughs> well, you've you probably you're probably familiar with Doc with the TARDIS and Doctor Who. It's bigger on the inside. Oh yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um. I will. Ad when it comes to when it comes to the that idea of home of homebrewing a whole world, have you have you considered um, examining how magic would work in in those in those kind of settings? Um, I I must admit I'm a little daunted by complete homebrew. Um, I. Applaud the people that are able to do it, but I think uh, because I have slight ADHD, so the the task of redesigning everything is a little bit daunting for me, and um, it kind of overwhelms me. So I like to change little bits at a time. Um, so I would probably make magic work the same as it it's intended on a base D and D level, and then maybe over time tweak things. Well, but um, let me let me let you in on a trade secret. Nobody do, nobody does it all at once. Everybody does it bits at a time. Okay, <laughs> I think I just see people far further developed into their <laughs> homebrew systems they've, than me, and I'm like, made... you have it all figured out. <laughs> um, I um, I have I have been developing my own setting that ha under the code name Project Gaia, which nice. Originally, originally, all all that I had was, I want, was I want to d I want to do my own do my own spin on certain motifs, not to not as some anti example, but just do do it in, do it in my do it in my way and re and representative of the things that gave that gave me ideas growing up, since mm -hmm. a lot of the traditions in D and D is just reflective of stuff that Gygax and Arneson just happen to be fans of. The sole reason law and chaos is in, is in there is because they were fans of Moorcock's work, for instance. Mm -hmm. Plus, I um, I've I I've gotten in a few spats with pe with pe with people during the, during the Tome of Battle incident in the early two thousands, where because God because God forbid you take inspiration from ma from manga. <laughs> <laughs> As silly as as silly as that sounds, there were some legit arguments about that back back in the day. Huh. And. Well. Oh, so, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. You first. I was gonna say, have you heard of Big Eyes Small Mouth? Um, I've heard I've heard of it. I've reviewed it, and I've had the developer of it on here, I think, three times. No, no, four nice. times. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, Discami has gr has graced my temple multiple times. <laughs> we backed it. We plan on playing it at some point, but that was really really cool to us. We're like, what? <laughs> um, if after you get a bit comfortable with it, I would recommend getting extras. Okay. 
it's it's basically the it's basically a um a kind a expanded grab bag of 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 rule set when it comes to Besom. Okay, gotcha. Um, but give now I I will I will admit when it comes to when it comes to the talk of preferred classes, I'm probably not one to I'm probably not one to talk because my, because well given given my name. <laughs> Oh, um, monks tend monks tend to get featured a lot whenever I make characters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and well, five in the Pathfinder and D and three point five days, I um I had to bend the rules a lot when it came to making monks work because they weren't very good. Mm -hmm. Mostly because of are you familiar with the term multiple ability dependency? Yeah. Third edition and, to a lesser extent, Pathfinder monks were a poster child for this. Yeah. Was... I I heard many a complaint. <laughs> yeah, they're consider um they were considered fourth tier. Um. Not ver not very high up. Then again, then again, the top then again the top tier was cleric and druid, which which gave rise to Godzilla. <laughs> also known as playing D and D on easy mode, because a cleric or a druid who knows what they're doing is an entire party all to themselves. Yeah. Oh. In five in five e, it's kind it's kind of morphed into cowzilla or cleric or warlock. Mm-hmm. But the. But the I will admit the big reason that I end up go uh, that I often end up going with monk is, well, growing up, growing up with so many martial arts movies certainly didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did I did have, I did have to ch I did have to cheat a few times because, of the because there's been there's been times where I had said, I want to do a monk, but I want it to I want it to be more I want it to be more like a um a a wo a woolen priest than the than the t than the typical barehanded monk. Mm, yeah. And that's ge that's generally that's generally how a lot of my homebrews end end up going about. It's usually a case of I want to do this, but the rules aren't letting me do it, so I'm go so I'm gonna break them. <laughs> Which. I think it. I think is. I think is par for. I think it's par for the course. In fact, Ga and even Gygax house ruled his own game. Um, oh jeez. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, have you ever heard of the? Have you ever heard of Rule Zero? No. Rule Zero has showed has shown up in multiple different um, interpretations, but the general vibe goes like this. This is. If the if the rules are getting in the way of if the rules are getting in the way of the fun, throw away the rules. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Now, with the, with all that in mind, while I have my own story when it comes to how I found out about Emberwind, how did you come across it? Um. So I went to Magfest right before. Uh, the great pandemic <laughs> and um it was it was literally like right before it was the year of um the last in-person magfest had uh before this year and um i as as one is wont to do um went to the indie rpg area to see if there's any other like Pathfinder D and D type games, and then I came across Emberwind, mm -hmm. and immediately fell in love. <laughs> to the point, I bought an entire package right there and then, <laughs> and then stayed up until five a.m. playing with my own group of people in the hotel room. <laughs> and if I'm being honest, I do think Emberwind provide is has a has a much low has a much lower um barrier event barrier of entry when it comes to getting people into the hobby yes i think that was their um their design mm -hmm. oh. i really liked it of course of course 
having 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 in having a art style that is indistinguishably theirs is not is certainly not going to hurt. Right. I mean, even you, the closest thing I could compare it to is the brushstroke style I saw so much with Guild Wars Two. Oh yeah, I could see that. Um, it's not a one to one thing, but it's that same emphasis on on paint on paint strokes. Yeah, it's it's towards that aesthetic in general. Mm -hmm. I like it. Of, co of course, of course, any game that's going to treat martial characters as as a little more than a one trick pony is already going to get my attention. <laughs> um, I really enjoy the subclasses that they've released so far. Um, it adds a lot of flavor because. They actually suggest that you use a subclass that doesn't match with your primary class mm -hmm. because a lot of the subclass abilities end up kind of being boot point um, with the primary class if they're the same. And you're able to get a more well-rounded character by swapping up the subclasses. And I thought that was a really neat idea because I was used to Pathfinder and D&D who had like their subclasses or circles or whatever that were specifically for that class. Yeah. Pathfinder didn't path I wouldn't say Pathfind the closest thing to subclass when it came to Pathfinder was prestiges, which is a mm -hmm. set of problems in, in and of in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> but the closest I can think of to path to subclasses with Pathfinder were the class variants. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the ones that the ones that would swap out um, features for different ones. Yeah. And of course, the problem the problem when it came to prestige classes is the it is the same problem they have with how feats work back then. The re way, the amount of requirements could get absurd to the point where you're planning ahead you're planning ahead several levels in advance, and not oh yeah le and not leveling up naturally. Yeah. Um, I've all I've I've sometimes called this the false choice effect. Like, you're free to you're free to choose you're free to choose at you're free to choose any feat that you want at this level, but you're prop but you're gonna end up picking this feat because what you actually want you need it you need to get a certain other feat as a prerequisite. Yeah. And while every critic has their whipping boys, mine per my personal whipping boy with feats. Has been and always will be whirlwind strike because of the ridiculous amount of prereqs that you needed for that. <laughs> oh yeah, whirlwind strike was a, a force of its own, honestly. And it's one that it's one that would get brought up frequently because one of my players is a big fan of Legend of Zelda. But I think you can see where this is going. Oh yeah. But. And I, I just I just dug it up for the Pathfinder first edition version. You needed Dex and Intelligence at thirteen, Combat Expertise, Dodge, Mobility, Spring Attack, and a BAB of four. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Which I'm just imagining that. I'm sorry. <laughs> which mean which which means that, that that's some um, that's like that's four, that's about eight levels worth of feats that you already that you already have to pick that you have to pick out already yeah yeah <laughs> and I, I uh, the other the other title for this kind of thing is what we call pay not to suck <laughs> yeah uh, I always, I think it appeals to a certain player type to be able to, like, map out their character ahead of time. But for most people, it's kind of more fun to peruse it as you go. Like, ooh, what has opened up to me now at, like, this level? Instead of, like, how do I get from point A to point B and then map my directions there? Well, from... I, um... In my... Before I before I had gotten into TTRPG, I, w I was a bit... I was... A, I was a big Lego guy, and like I, I had, I had that big blue bucket and everything, and I would spend more of my time freestyling than I than mm -hmm. I would actually following the directions. 
where I'd follow mm-hmm. the directions. It's more fun to freestyle. And then, I'd, <laughs> and then I'd never follow them again. And I'd just do my own thing. Yeah, yeah, you're like, okay, cool, I built the thing. Now it's time to play. Actually play. <laughs> and because of because of that, what I... F- I find it I find it far more interesting for when when I see people come up with, come up with um come up with improvised mods for improvised mods or builds um as the, in order to meet what they want to do rather than what's ideal. Um I think one one of my favorite stories in regard in regards to that is somebody who wanted who um when they were told that magic missile is useless they looked at the they looked at the meta magic feats and they decided to they decided you know what I'm gonna make this work. So he ended up creating a build he co- he called all the magic missile. Nice. Because it the so, the sole thing that it, the sole thing that it does is 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 figure out how how many magic missiles can I fire in one turn. The answer is yes. Sometimes firing <laughs> twenty eight magic missiles in one shot. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, granted, against enemies with spell resistance, he was kind of screwed. But the, whole, but the whole thing is, he did it just to see if he could do it. Um, yeah, yeah. The infamous Los Tiburon is a half orc monk who, who, who is less kung fu and more lucha libre. <laughs> um, I in my early days, I had played a rogue who was built, who was, who was all, who was all about making traps. Nice. Some of which I some of which I ripped off wholesale from watching too much Looney Tunes. <laughs> um, in, and in one ca- in one case, I had I had asked my GM, "Hey, can can I give my wi- can I give my wizard a, sp- a spell called Summon Anvil?" <laughs> oh, sorry, it wasn't Summon Anvil. It was Anvil Drop. Anvil drop. Oh no! <laughs> if you've se- if you've seen an old cartoon, you know exactly what Anvil drop does. <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine with the um Ben. Uh, what was it? Tom and Jerry. <laughs> Tom, Tom and Jerry, Wally Coyote, basically anything that Tex Avery or Chuck Jones were involved in back in the day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and of course the story I've I've told. That some people consider my finest moment is a trap called the up button. Mm. It is a rune trap. You step on the thing, and well, the the way it's described, you go up. <laughs> the technical term is you you end up tr- you end up being the subject of a fly spell straight up at forty miles an hour for six seconds. Oh wow! If anything's in the way. It it either it either takes it either takes damage, or if it or if it's too hard to take damage, you take crushing damage. Oh man! Oh man! Because <laughs> all all that matters is you're going up. If it, if something's right. in the way that is that isn't gonna budge, well, you've seen what a compactor does. Yep. <laughs> Smash. <laughs> which is which is how a dragon at the end of a campaign got de- got dealt with because. The ceiling was made of adamantite. That stuff's not oh. bud- that stuff's not budging. Oh. <laughs> no, not at all. No, so <laughs> you end up with flat dragon. But I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if you had if you had seen this as well when it came to Ember Wind. But something something that I that I will freely admit I I liked was cap. mm Hmm. You know, see, seeing seeing that ver- seeing those varying results all all through a single D twenty like that, um, kind of remind kind of reminds me of stuff like of oh, stuff like phase rip where it's a D one hundred with all all the degrees of success laid out for you on one chart. Yeah, yeah, I I do enjoy that as well because um, it makes it easy. You roll one die and you know exactly what what you're getting or what you're not getting in some cases. Um, and I also thought it was super interesting that the object is to roll lower or equal to those numbers uh, versus the traditional TTRPG that we've experienced so far, like um, D&D, high. Pathfinder. Mm. Yeah. Um, so. Now, 
one of the other one of the other things, and this is something that I was a bit curious on your on your take, is the fact that when it comes to re when it comes to resolution and um, character creation, there's two different sub there's two subtypes involved. And okay, you know the, when it came to, when it came to character creation, the aspect system and the attribute system. Mm -hmm. um, during your experience with Emberwind, which of the two have you preferred? I typically go to uh, kind of their default, uh, the one where it's kind of laid out. You just choose different things like are you heroic uh, versus rolling for everything. Although it can be fun to roll for everything. I just also like the fact that you could take those and then explain part of your character with them. Like my character is heroic and focused and she's really good at helping you find the path and isn't scared of taking charge in case anything jumps out. Like it's just really nice for role play aspects to be able to just go with those. Um, but if you're a little more experienced with role playing, you don't necessarily need the help with how your character is personality wise, mm -hmm. then rolling everything is just as nice because then you can come up with your own things for them. Yeah. And now I've, Obviously, there, obviously, there's that three by three setup when it comes to classes. And given the back, given the background that you that you had, um, which classes did which classes did you find yourself leaning towards? I am naturally leaning towards uh, druid, of course, and then uh, ranger. I think is what their bow and arrow user is called. Archer. Um, or archer, archer, yeah. Um, Definitely not because of color choices or anything at all. <laughs> <clears throat> no, not no, not at all. I have no idea what you're talking about. Not in the not in the slightest. Uh, but I I do plan to play test all of them and the combinations and eventually decide like my own ranking of like absolute favorite to least favorite without bias and then my favorites with bias. <laughs> um. But that's also why I'm enjoying the subclasses that they're releasing because they change the the way the base class works just enough in terms of the diverse amounts of skills that you can do. And I'm really looking forward to playtesting the different combos and, and seeing how it feels. Yeah. I will admit I've leaned a little bit towards um, Atla Atlanta and Tactician. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh. Those are pretty good ones. A lot of that is because in my time with um, Fourth Edition, the version of D and D that everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because the checks don't clear. <laughs> um, my favorite class was the Warlord. Mm. This uh, this uh, this idea of the of this lead from the front com lead from the front commander who is some is something that I always enjoyed. Um. 5e tried has has tried to argue that it that it has an equivalent with the battlemaster but it's not <laughs> it yeah it, yeah but the the <laughs> the core the core principle with with a warlord as one person put it is a barbarian hits you with his axe a warlord hits you with his barbarian <laughs> nice oh is there's there's been plenty there's been plenty I've seen I've seen some people say that you that you should you should be able to do the um warlord archetype with the fighter but not ri not really because their whole their whole thing is you is maneuver is maneuvering e maneuvering everybody like it like the, like the battlefield is their own chessboard mhm mm that's not to say a lot they, like chess master yeah <laughs> that's not the I've seen some say that you can do that you can do that kind of thing with bards, but if I'm being honest, um the problem with the problem with bards is everyone gets so hung up on the whole musical instrument part. Oh yeah. I agree. Like when I think of my favorite when I think of my fa if someone were to ask me my favorite um bard in in say vi in say video games it's honestly Varric in Dragon Age, who doesn't use an instrument. 
Mm, I like, um, I was inspired by a bard from Final Fantasy 14. 13? 14. Ah, 14. <laughs> Um, good, good save. I was, I was about to, I was about to make raise some very pointed questions, <laughs> but I, I could, yeah. I could certainly see that even though the bard in the, in that instance is still using an instrument. Um, but primarily, I think it's a a bow and arrow. Yeah. The, yeah. The key thing to bards in in my in my view is they are storytellers. And that exactly, that is yeah. the aspect that I think I think more people should focus on. Um I do rem I do remember one I do remember when telling that and then one of my players um came up with came up with a folk tale for each spell that, that he had in his spell book. <laughs> so he was he wasn't invoking he he wasn't doing some arcane invocation. He was invoking the st he was invoking the story. Mm, yeah. Oh. Have it, you heard of the Wheel of Time by chance? Yes. Not so big, um, not so big on the on the way it got adapted on Amazon Prime, but I have I have read through the I've read through the books. I have a I have a mixed relationship with the Wheel of Time. <laughs> <laughs> As is fair, um, but in my mind, the Glee Man is a good bard example. Someone who has good stories to sell, tell and can entertain a crowd, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd, I'd say the the if the bard if it weren't for the, if it weren't for its evolution into a diplomancer, the bard would have been as bad as it was in the early days of D anD. d Mm-hmm. Which is part of the reason why the most snake bitten class has always has been the ranger. Yeah. You know, which is which in the last five years has gotten what three or four revisions, and it's still having problems. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, largely because largely because well, the unfor the unfortunate question is. Why play a ranger when you can do everything that it can do and more with a druid? Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm I could see that question. Oh. Uh, I will I will admit that the next time I di next time I dip into Emberwind I'm probably going to go with Ardent. If only if only because lighting things on fire is always fun. Yeah, you know, lighting things on fire is definitely fun. Um, have you played any of their vignettes? Not necessarily. A lot, a lot of the times, a lot of the times when I when I would run um, Emberwind, I would I would I would be doing I, I don't really I don't really I would do it I would just I would just do my own thing. Mm hmm. Oh. That's not that's not to that's not to slag their vin, their vignettes. It's just, it's just I have, I have a I have a very DIY at I have a very DIY almost punkish attitude with how with how I um do games. I definitely understand that. Um, I was just saying if you took a look through Wailing Song, I really like how they implemented uh alcohol and fire. <laughs> Two things that go absolutely lovely together. Yeah, it's um, there's a type of alcohol that stinks and tastes so badly, but is so um, what's the word? It it's just one of those things where if you threw it and it had enough force on it, it would combust. Um, there's a word that I'm trying to think of, but it, it's it's slipping my mind. Um, unstable. There we go. The liquid is so unstable that it combusts on impact and causes a big area of fire. And I really enjoyed that idea alone. I thought it was really cool. So, how long do you think it's? How long do you think it's going to take before somebody utilizes that to do a to do a drunken boxer? You know, that's a great question. Probably not very long. <laughs> 
Like I can imagine Brewmaster Monk with that. Yeah, because I I've done my, I've done I've done my fair share of of broom of of um, Brewmaster Monk. Although the last time I did it, it was a dwarf because dwarven ale. Mm hmm. Oh, and it was also it was it was also the other reason I went with dwarf is because some. Um, and this has been a this has been a running gag in the temple for years. Um, the qu the question of if dwarves live underground, why do they why do they always use axes? The answer is quite <laughs> simple: elves live in trees. Ouch! <laughs> I take personal offense. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self evident that. that all are cremated oh equal. My gosh. Not wrong, not wrong though. <laughs> no, but as a woodland elf, I'm not. I'm not exactly gonna cop up to that one. <laughs> um, I most of the time, I end, most of the time, I end up playing Dragonborn, anyways. Nice. Um, usually, 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 um, either blue or either blue or white because. We've seen fire breath, we've seen ice breath, but we don't see enough lightning breath. Yeah. Yeah, that that's something that I've been I mean, there's storm giants, so it has to come from somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And I will ad I will admit the last time I did I did mess around with lightning, I um I had I had envisioned that kind of lightning breath as akin to the dirty lightning effect that you see in volcanoes. Mm -hmm. You know where it's where where these smoke clouds have enough friction that it's generating um, lightning storms. Yeah, it's an it's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, now when it came when it when it came to as far as I'm aware, they've released four subclasses so far. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Of the of the. F of the four, because I'm I'm assuming you have all four. Which has been your which has been your favorite? Um, those are kind of tied, but that's also from a, a position of not having play tested all four of them. Mm -hmm. But in concept, uh, from actual play testing, I like I believe it's called Wild Thing. Um, let me grab it up, but um. I liked that one because that one allows you to change into actual other forms, so the shape shifting. Um, and then the uh, Elysian Legionnaire was very interesting, but I, I, I felt like um, that one had a nice, what's the word? Um, kind of like it's very thor it's very lightning and thor accentuated um i haven't play tested that one yet but it looks cool um savior also looks cool i think that one's more like a cleric -y types of subclass but then the newest one the hikaku i really like that one too because it's like a summoner type where you summon things and they and you have them fight for you um and from reading through it it's got me excited especially because you can uh, summon a feline familiar type mm -hmm. uh, called the Celestial Meow. Meow. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Those The Hikaku and the, the Wild Fang both appeal to me more personally. But I could see where the others could be very useful in terms of um, if you planned out your your primary class with a subclass correctly, it could be very strategic. Mm -hmm. And which is the... so. In, in other words, in other words, you want you want to do a Hecow build so you can so you can become a Pokemon master. Got it. <laughs> Actually, I, that's what I played last night. Um, I did Druid Hecow. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna go with, I was gonna go with either that or, um, or Raido Kuzunoha, but I'm not sure how familiar you, you are with the, with um, the Mega Ten series. 
not too familiar by those names. I often have seen things, but I only recognize, like, the character. <laughs> well. You'd probably get a kick out of folklore, but that's a whole, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> and... What about... I, no, go ahead. I was going to ask, what about you? Which one were you appealed to the most? Um... I'd say, Elise, I'd say of the four so far, Elysian Legionnaire. Um, mm -hmm. I will, I will admit, I will admit, I was very tempted to call, to call out the devs when it came to that "ride the lightning" qu quote in the PDF. <laughs> it's like, okay, I know what you were listening to with this, but yeah, to be. But a a close a close second for a close second for me would be, um, the savior. Okay. Um, so we're kind of like opposite. <laughs> the the big re the big reason that the big reason that I end up I end up liking the savior is I I will always find it I will always find it interesting when a cla when a class is um. Kit allows me to be an aggressive defender. Mm hmm Yeah. It's very easy it's very easy to be at to be a to be a tank and just have high def have high defense and get everybody to try and hit you. Mm hmm It's far more interesting to have to have a defensive character who's more of a counter puncher. If you follow me. Yeah. I yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. Because in those, I like it. in those kind of situations, it gives it gives people playing that style a reason to want to get into the thick of it, as opposed to getting into a th the the problem that the problem that I have with the t with the typical tank archetype is you are is that person is experiencing less of the game than everyone else because they're ju they're just supposed to be they're just supposed to get in there and and soak. And mm -hmm. while they can certainly be good at that, it's not all that appealing when you when your when your palette in order to contribute is less than other people. That's the reason I've never been a fan of the um, of the martial magic divide you see in D and D, where um, casting characters get more game out of the game. Yeah, I I think it it's also based on perspective. And what your play style is, because there are some people who are like, um, <laughs> darkness from Kanasuba, <laughs> who just want to uh, take all the damage so nobody else gets hurt, and that makes them happy. Because if if they're able to mitigate the damage for their other party members, then you know th am... there's less healing that's going to have to happen. <laughs> Interesting example: going with a full-on masochist. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the best example I could think of off the top of my head. <laughs> What's next? Are you going to tell um, me that Aqua is useful? No, definitely not. <laughs> uh, but uh, the only other one I can think of is from uh, uh, Mash from Fate. Mm -hmm. With the giant shield. Yeah, and I'd say... when it, the, the, Atlant the Atlanta... I. Th I think the Atlanta as a whole, and to a lesser extent, the Savior, is mm -hmm. very much, very much trying to, um, very much trying to evoke um, the the idea the idea of the of the Greek soldier. I mm -hmm. think especially especially the Spartan when it comes to when it comes to the idea of the of the um, giant shield, because when I th whenever I think of a large shield. Um, I always end up thinking of those of those big Spartan shields or the tower shields that Romans had. Yeah. Which the Sp the Spartan shield in particular because because that putting aside the fact that it's a that it's a big round cir it's a big round circle. Um it's as, it's just as much of an offensive thing as a defensive thing. Mhm. Mm <clears throat> and once and some and a group that's got the rhythm going, it's just a steamroller. Yeah, yeah, I can see that too. Plus, 
I remember playing a um a ha a hack of D and D called Fantasy Craft where they didn't list shields in the armor section. They listed it as a as a blunt weapon. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Using it as a like a, a weapon, like I attack with my shield, like a backhand almost. <laughs> well, the Sc the Scots had targes, which are just shields with a spike. Mm hmm So there there's a there's a historical precedent for these kind of things. Um, I did when it came to when it came to the Hakau, I did I did make I did make a bit of a a bit of a gag the one the one time it got tested where I said if you use this if you you have to have it you have to have a one handed sword and it has to be treated as a kopesh. Um, if you're not familiar, a, a kopesh is a is a kind of um curved sword that was usually made with bronze um. That was fa that was famous in ancient Egypt. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I can see that because it it definitely has the Egyptian tie. Mm -hmm. But the other re the other major reason that the that um the savior I f was something I found interesting was the co was the concept of of um cha of channeling spirits because. The la um the last time that I played barbarian it's the the approach that I took with rages and and is something is something I still do is that they is that a barbarian raging is not just them getting angry they're possessed by an animal spirit mm yeah I could see that usually usually a wolf or a or a bear yeah yeah and back in fourth edition, that was how, that was how their rages pretty much worked. You were pos you were possessed by an a you were possessed by an animal spirit. Hmm. I never got to play fourth edition, so that's it's kind of cool to know. Get, fourth edition gets a lot of flack, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but I do think there's a degree of overhate. Mm-hmm. Um, especially with that whole vi that whole t the turning f the turning D and D into an um into an MMO argument that a lot of people made with it which I might be able to buy okay. if I didn't hear that exact same argument 20 years ago <laughs> when thir when third edition came out yeah and I've never I've never understood what what makes some um, what makes taking inspiration from MMOs off limits Right, because I think those are like the visualization of TTRPGs, or that's like the inspiration where it came from, and oh. then, and being inspired in turn by the MMOs, you know, it just it's kind of cool, like well, the, sort of the, online, right? The the way that the way that I've have you ever heard the expression "When in Rome, do as the Romans do"? Yeah. Um. Computer games and D and D have a have a lot have a, a much more shared history than I think a lot of people realize. Especially, especially given all of the SSI games that were made in the early days of computers, as well as mm -hmm. the fact that there was a there was a D, there was a program on the Plato systems back in the seventies that was tr that was trying to run a primitive version of AD and D. Oh, just replacing the ampersand with an N because there wasn't an ampersand symbol on, on the Play-Doh engine. Again, this was the 70s. Right. But the... And even, and even, even with that, as I mentioned before, a lot of the things that are considered tradition are just things that Gygax and Arneson happened to be fans of at the time. And you look at more recent, ga you look at more recent games, and their inspirations are things they happen to be fans of. So I don't I don't see a reason why why that why that tradition shouldn't um shouldn't continue with things that uh, that that um that other people happen to grow up with. Yeah. Um, in a long time ago, I had pr I had predicted that I was going to see more game I was going to see more games that were taking inspiration from 
anime because you're going to have a whole generation of designers who took that as their big inspiration. Right. And I think I think history has borne me out. <laughs> not going to no, <laughs> say I'm Nostradamus or anything, mostly because I, my predictions end up being right. Um, but that that aside, um, I'm I'm curious I'm curious what you think of what you thought of the deck of fates mechanic within within Emberwind. I think it's interesting as a concept. I haven't actually given it a try, but it sounds interesting, and I plan to eventually give it a try. Which is understandable because. From what I from what I understand, you're using Foundry, correct? Uh, we used Foundry last night, but I've been using um. <laughs> Before we were playing on my stream, I was coding for Foundry to help people get onto Foundry. Um, but you can play it on Foundry. It's just not as nice as like the D and D character sheets are. Um, but I was playing it on Roll20 because I didn't know how to set it up on Foundry myself without the character sheet integration and things like that. Um, I mainly play D&D on Foundry, personally. Oh, so, oh, so you're, fam you're familiar with the, pr with the coder's drinking game. <laughs> 99 little I'm... bugs in the code. 99 bugs in the code. You take one down, you <laughs> patch it around. 108 little bugs in the code. Yeah, well, that's also my day job, so I'm used to coding. But um, Foundry is a whole other beast. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm certain. Um, there were t there were times where I where I did custom APIs for my own campaigns in Roll Twenty, and mm -hmm. I was very thankful that I that I have a that I have a punching bag in my office. <laughs> you know, so I, yeah, so I, I have something to safely. Bang my head! Bang my head against when I end up running into a wall. It's always the semicolons. Let me tell you. <laughs> Plus, do you know what? Do you know what the difference is between it between a programmer whose code works and one whose code doesn't work? I feel like this is a joke, so I'm gonna say no. He Enlighten no, me. He has no idea how it. He has no idea how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Code doesn't work. I have no idea what's wrong. Code works. I have no idea what's right. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, yes, the code worked without any problems. Wait, the code worked without any problems. <laughs> of course, of course. Then you have to look to look at a code that works and and find a way to improve upon it. And on your best day, it's like disassembling a bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, uh, or the worst or the worst game of keep talking and nobody explodes. <laughs> uh, and it, that particular deck, I'm I'm a sucker for card mechanics within within games. Um, and for me personally, that 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 um that deck of fate. Is some is something that is something that I'd I'd only br I'd only break that out in sp in special occasions. Usually, usually the and instead of having someone draw one, just to add to the clenching, I would draw I would draw five and have someone p and have someone pick one. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. No, because it's um because. At that point, at that point, when you've got multiple cards and you can only pick one, then you've got the mental game going on. Yeah. And yeah. Let's be let's be honest. Every, every GM has their has their moments of sadism. Yeah, I could say I could I could say that. <laughs> there are those who will claim that they don't, and I call those people liars. Oh. But it but it but within the, within that have you I there's there's been a handful of people who have done house rules when it comes to 
and homebrew when it comes to Emberwind. Have you have you considered doing home homebrew to kind of mix in some of the stuff you've been doing with D and D into it? I am considering that for the future, mm -hmm. but at the moment, I'm trying to, uh, as I as, as I've said on my stream at one point, uh, I'm trying to be as at good as good at all of the rules and how everything works as Derek. <laughs> Trying to um, understand the rules just, before you break them. Pretty much. And also, um, I am trying to build myself as like a person that someone can come and ask questions about Emberwind. Um, any question. And I would like to be able to answer it for the most part. With the very few, let me ask Derek about that one, <laughs> things. So, um... That is my goal to eventually get to that point. And when I get to that point, then I'll better know how to break them or change them so they're not so broken, but they work within like D and D five, things like that. So I'm really curious to see where it goes. Because well, some some of the things are going to be easier said than done. I I'd, I'd I'd imagine. Yeah. <laughs> Truth be t truth be told, uh, if there's anything I'm if there's anything I'd ha I'd hack re regarding um regarding Emberwind, it's creating a it's creating a proper monk class because the closest that's there is the spiritualist, and that doesn't quite fit um fill the niche. Yeah. Maybe they'll have a monk subclass though eventually. Who's to say? Yeah, that's what I'm. Wa that's why I'm waiting to see to to see the full batch of su of subclasses before I jump into that, just in case. Just in case somebody beats me to the punch, or if, or mm -hmm. if I end up or if I end up stepping on somebody's toes, which has certainly ha certainly happened before. I mean, well, I'm a, I'm, bi I'm bigger than most, so I'm inevitably going to step on somebody's toes literally. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but. In, in jump in jumping between being a player and be and being a GM, which is which is a hell of a leap for a lot of people at the best of days. Um, what what were some what were some habits that you had to unlearn, and what were some habits that you had to unlearn when it came to jumping into Emberwind? Um. So I I actually I had to unlearn certain habits like uh from Pathfinder. Because there was your, what was it, primary action and secondary action mm. from Pathfinder. And then in D&D, in &D it's called bonus action. Uh, there's no such thing as those things in Emberwind. Um, so when I first got into d and I'd say for my secondary action, and people would look at me where I'm like, I mean, bonus action. <laughs> um, but getting into Emberwind, I'm kind of wanting to do things like I'd like to roll to um, I don't know, a uh, sleight of hand or something like that. And those things don't exactly exist in Emberwind really. Um, and I'm interested in seeing where those do kind of exist. So that way if somebody were coming from say D&D &D into Emberwind I can say, hey, these are the different skill checks you can do, and this is what they do. Um, because I think right now it's more like whatever the book says should be the skill check would be the skill check. Like mm -hmm. the diplomacy one, if you will, um, from Pathfinder would be the fast-talking one, I think, in Emberwind. And things like that. So there's little subtle things like that but going from player and dm i had to um and and vice versa i had to unlearn doing things like uh helping other people play their classes um because oftentimes i would end up with the people that have never played a, a ttrpg before especially when i was dming pathfinder because it was at a local hobby shop and every wednesday night was pathfinder night and we ran the pre-made, pre-generated uh, stories because people were getting into them and learning how to play for the first time. So I had to learn to stop walking other people through playing their character <laughs> um, and just sit back and enjoy being a character instead of being in control of all of the things. 
Um, but I will say, having DM'd and played, they've both helped each other immensely in my play style and my DMing style. Mm-hmm. And when it, I'm guess I'm guessing something else. I'm guessing something else that was a bit of a learning experience was not ha- was not having to deal with the limitation factor on casters. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was kind of nice. I like that Emberwind is pretty straightforward. Um, you have X amount of moves, uh, either one slow and two fast, or four fast or two slow. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really like that it allows for a good diversity of, of abilities and stuff like that. And it has you picking your skills in a different way. And I, I, I think it's awesome. And now, with the, with that in mind, I I know that you've been going through um em, going through Emberwind, specifically going through their sky, their um Skies campaign. Um, mm-hmm. what do you what do you can what can you tell me about what you've got planned when that when that campaign reaches its conclusion? I think our plan is to probably go through the. F- both books that they have, the Skies of Axia and uh, their Songweave Tapestry, I think is what the other one is called. And um, I just want to show people a way of playing Emberwind. And um, I'm really grateful to be involved with a group of other people that are used to role playing and things like that. Because uh, that, that makes it nice for people to see how it could be played. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to role play, um, and also remind people that just because we chose this course of actions doesn't mean that those are the same course of actions that you guys are going to choose. Um, <laughs> case in point, uh, we ended up our stream a little early last night because all of us decided to not fight the first fight, and the DM was not ready for it. <laughs> So, um, for some of us, we we played like the beginning of Skies multiple times, where we usually do join in on the fight in the first part. But um, it was one of those things where I kind of differentiated as my character. Like, okay, I don't really care personally if I fight this fight or not. But what ties would I have with my party or with the environment? That would make me maybe not want to do it and think about it in that manner. Um, but also the uh, the vignettes they have are really nice little stepping stones between the first book and the second book because they are continuations of different outcomes. And I believe there's five different outcomes from the first book. So it's, it's kind of cool. It's like this is what happened in the meantime. Oh, yeah. But also, all of your choices from the first book affect the second book. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really awesome too. Yeah, and I'll I'll, cer- I'll certainly be keeping an eye on that on that development in on my own end. Um, I can't do it. I can't give Emberwind the Valley of the Judge treatment because we're doing that with, for something else at the at the moment. But mm-hmm. I'm sure I'm sure I, I'm sure I'll find I'm sure I'll end up figuring out a way to squeeze things in. I always do, but. <laughs> With the, with all that in mind, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into D and D or Emberwind or just to just to la- just to laugh at the bard who got himself killed again, the <laughs> door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, <laughs> on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay 
fucking frosty, everybody.